All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here tonight for the Earth Day watercolor paint along with local artist Zoe Van Duvenboot. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Zoe. Zoe is an Indonesian American artist who works with watercolor, pen and ink, clay and digital mediums. Her work is inspired by the natural wonders of the planet, especially the ocean. Zoe is passionate about the environment and uses visual art as a platform to share its beauty and advocate for its protection. During this program, she's gonna share her love of the ocean with participants um, while guiding us through the motions of painting with watercolors. And then after the program, we'll all be able to walk away with a flowy ocean themed painting and inspiration to visit the beach for this upcoming Earth Day. Um, again, if you have your supplies out, that's great. If you don't, remember to grab some paper, a pencil and pen and an eraser, uh, a few paint brushes, and then a watercolor paint set. Um, and then just a plug, um, thank you so much to the Friends of Los Gatos Library. They sponsor all of our programs. You can donate to them or schedule a book donation or learn how to volunteer with them on their website, which is friendsoflglibrary.org. And with that, I'll pass it over to Zoe. Great, thanks so much for the introduction and welcome again, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Um, Again, I'm Zoe Van Dieven Bode, and I currently reside in San Jose. Um, and I am the owner of Fine Zoe Art, as well as the artist behind it. Um, and yeah, so I, like I said, I'm really excited to be here and share some of my watercolor skills with all of you. Um, I've learned a lot throughout the years, not through school or anything like that, just through a lot of trial and error. And as much as I can pass on to others who are interested in painting, um, I would be really happy to help you avoid some of the mistakes that I made in the past. Um, so just a quick overview of what the next hour will look like. Um, first, I will kind of share a little bit about my background and how I got into painting and why I love kelp in the ocean so much. Um, then I will walk you through kind of setting up your um, station as well as guide you in how to draw kelp. We'll be focused on giant kelp for today, um, which is a brown algae. And then we'll go over some, uh, just a few watercolor steps um, and techniques that I use when I paint kelp. Um, and then throughout the time, I'll be dropping a lot of kelp knowledge. Um, and I just wanted to say, if you have any questions about um, painting or anything I say, related to kelp or whatever, just feel free to unmute yourself um, and just ask me. I'd love for this to be, you know, more of a conversation. Um, I'm here to answer any questions as best as I can. I'm also not a, an expert. So yeah, with that, um, I guess I can just <clears throat> get started with a little bit of my background so you can get to know me a little bit. Hey, Lindsay. <laughs> um, I've been painting on again, off again since high school. And it's really always just been like a hobby for me. Um, nothing that I took super seriously. And, you know, I've lived in Southern California and then moved up to Seattle, Washington for a while. And, and during this time, I really started getting into um, watercolor painting while I was traveling. So I had this like small little watercolor kit with me that I would take when I would travel abroad or go on camping trips or hiking um, or backpacking trips, wherever I went, it was like really fun for me to, rather than taking out my phone or my camera to take out my like little paint set and just paint what I was seeing. And for me, that was like my photo and an opportunity for me to capture the moment that I was um, having and um, get to keep that for myself. Um, and I've always had like a very deep connection to the planet and, you know, growing up in Southern California, I swam in the ocean almost every single day. I went hiking and camping a lot, um, backpacking and all of these things are still very integral to who I am. Um, and it's definitely reflected in a lot of the art that I do. So a lot of the things that I focus in on are natural places, usually the things that are around me. Um, and also things that I have a special attachment to um, in specific places. So as I alluded to, I do not have a background um, in art and I'm all self-taught. 
And I've taken a few like ceramics classes and one watercolor class in the past, but everything that I'm about to teach you today is just from my own brain. Um, so take it or leave it. Maybe you love it. Maybe it's um, for you or maybe it's not for you. Um, so just a little bit about my background. So when I start talking about the ocean and kelp, you'll be like, oh yeah, this person is like semi-credible. Um, I studied environmental management and protection at Humboldt State University. Um, which is really where I got my toes wet with how to protect our environment, what are the environmental problems that we're facing, um, as well as what we can do um, as humans and as society to really protect our planet. Um, and then from there, I you know, got really interested in the marine sciences um, and my passion for the ocean and for protecting the ocean really just amplified. Um, I'm Indonesian and my family is from Indonesia and I've gone there quite a few times and, and just seeing the small islands where my family are from um, and how they're very low lying and just imagining any amounts of sea level rise, what that would do to the small villages that some of my family are from really hit home for me and made me want to continue my education and study climate change, specifically how it impacts the marine environment and coastal communities. Um, so that's kind of my background um, in education and, you know, climate science and environmental science isn't necessarily super accessible to everybody. Um, when I try to talk to some of my family members or just some friends, sometimes it doesn't really resonate. And honestly, climate science and environmental science doesn't really resonate with me either. Um, so it's been kind of a struggle to really keep up with everything and, and really understand like, what is the science? What is the data trying to tell me? Um, and while in graduate school, I really focused in on um, the intersection between communication and education and climate science and environmental science and really wanting to be that bridge to um, translate really complex information to just every person that I know. Because ultimately communicating about the problem is like the most important thing. Um, we don't, we can't do anything about it if we don't understand it. Um, so I figured, you know, what is a better way to communicate um, environmental problems and things that our oceans are facing, which, you know, we don't necessarily see what's going on underneath the ocean, than for me to paint it um, and for me to merge my education and my passion and the things that I learn, um, as well as my passion in painting and creating um, and being an artist. So that's kind of a really long background about me um, and where I am today. So if you go on my Instagram, um, you'll see just a lot of paintings that are related to the ocean, to kelp, to coastal communities, to mountains, all of which are places that are special to me and that are also vulnerable to the impacts of climate change because let's face it, pretty much everything is vulnerable to the impacts of climate change these days and it's really critical that we celebrate the places that we love um, so that we can also get behind protecting it. Cool, so now we can get to the fun stuff. So today we're going to be painting giant kelp, which is my personal favorite kelp. Um, I will try to pronounce the name, but I have a lisp, so it sounds really weird when I say it. Um, it's Macrocystis pyrifera, um, which is a brown algae, and it's actually the, the fastest growing organism on earth. Um, so super cool. And I chose to, usually I really like to draw giant kelp and paint giant kelp because it's super fluid and organic um, and also very forgiving. So um, also you'll learn that watercolor is a very forgiving medium too. Um, cool, so before I continue on and share my personal love story for giant kelp, um, I just wanna make sure that everybody is set up with their stations and you have everything that you need before we get started. Um, so let's see, everyone should have a piece of paper out. I use watercolor paper um, for me that it really is able to capture a lot of the color um, that I'm putting down on the piece of paper and it absorbs it really well. Usually I put blue tape on it. Um, if you've used watercolor before, you might notice that the paper starts to like crinkle in. Um, so tape is a really great way for you to keep it kind of down on, on and not folding in on itself as well as creating a very nice looking border. Also Julia's cat is just like super loving and cute right now. 
<laughs> I love them. Um, cool. So if you have that out, and then what you'll need right now is a pencil and then an eraser. So the, we're first just going to start drawing it um, and drawing the kelp as well. Um, and then in terms of paint colors, what I'm going to be using today is a green. Um, you can probably see that it's an olive green, um, this kind of brown color. So the color of giant kelp is usually this like kind of coppery gold brown. Um, and then I'll also be using any types of blue for the background. So I think I have some here, I have a, a blue that I have there for the background and another blue. And then I'll be using maybe a little bit of green for the background as well. So if you wanna just, you know, get set up with grabbing some of your paints and honestly, it doesn't have to be any of the colors that I just said, like you can make your kelp purple, you can make it orange, you can make it any color that you want. I just suggest having, um, you know, one main color, one accent color for kelp and then same with the background. Um, cool, so as everybody's getting all of their stuff set up, um, I guess I can just kind of walk you through how I generally draw out kelp and the different elements um, of uh, the giant kelp. So this piece right here um, is the main stalk. It is called the stipe. Um, and so usually I'll draw the stipe first. So just um, really any way that you want, just draw the stipe and then all of the rest of the blades, which is um, this piece right here, will be coming off of it. So feel free to just go ahead and draw while I'm kind of walking you through this and, and explaining different parts of the giant kelp. Um, and you can't see it here, but usually kelp, kelp is very interesting in that it doesn't need roots to be inside of the ground at all. Um, their roots are called a holdfast and um, a holdfast, it kind of looks like roots and it's really just around a rock. And it does, the hold fast does exactly as it sounds. It's just latching onto something and keeping it in one place. Um, kelp does not need to get its nutrients through its roots. Kelp gets its nutrients through photosynthesis um, as well as nutrients in the water. So um, I can continue and tell you how it does that um, in a second. But another piece of kelp um, that's really, um, you know, pretty quintessential kelp is the, little bladders right here, um, what I have right there as well. And that's filled with a gas that really helps the kelp float up to the surface so that it can photosynthesize because the closer it is to the sun, the better it's able to photosynthesize um, and get that food. So usually there's always a blade that's coming off of um, the bladders that you'll see and the bladder um, and the blade that's coming off the stipe is usually not uniform whatsoever. Like if you've seen pictures of kelp, it honestly looks like a mess um, because it's just flowing with the current. There's all these blades and all these, uh, you know, different stalks that are running into each other. It can be like really messy. Um, so for the purposes of this drawing, I wanted to make it like pretty simple and, um, being able to separate all of the blades so it's easy for folks to draw. Cool, so can I just see with like a thumbs up or whatever, or a thumbs, are people like good to move on or are people still drawing? For anyone who just came in, um, we're, are we just drawing the root or are we also trying to draw some of the blades? Yep, yeah, just pretty much as, if you want it to look kind of like this, you can just draw something like this. Um, and yeah, maybe I can let people who are just topping on kind of have a second to, to get their drawing down. Um, and while people are drawing, I can share a little bit more about giant kelp and, and why I think it's really awesome. Um, so as I said a little bit before that giant kelp is the, the fastest growing organism on the planet. Um, and fastest growing as in giant kelp can grow one to two feet a day, um, which is a lot more than I've grown um, in like 10 plus years. Um, and it can also reach around 150 to 175 feet 
um, it can grow that much in one growing season, which is a lot. Um, and kelp um, is an annual plant, so it doesn't die after every season, it just persists. Um, and kelp is, giant kelp is really common. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it before. If you just go out to Pacifica or any um, beach here in the Bay Area, you'll probably be seeing giant kelp um, out there or maybe some bull kelp. And it really likes cold waters. Um, that's because cold waters are really rich with nutrients as well. Um, so you can find giant kelp all the way in Baja, California and all the way up to Alaska. It's also found in like South America, Australia, New Zealand, all places that I want to go. Um, and for those of you who have had the opportunity to go scuba diving in kelp, when you get to the um, you know bottom of the ocean and you look up, kelp creates this really beautiful um, and impressive underwater forest. Um, and commonly, you know, you're not going to find just one strand of kelp. You'll find a lot of different kelp together. I mean, a lot of kelp together, creating this really dense underwater forest. Um, and this forest then creates a really amazing habitat for a lot of different species. And it's an indicator of ocean health. So if you see really healthy um, kelp, then you'll know that there's probably a lot of species there um, who are making it home, who are going there to find food, um, going there to maybe find a mate um, or just hanging out. So it's, it's a really, um, great indicator for ocean health and for a happy, healthy, productive ecosystem. Another cool fact before we move on and start painting is that kelp produces a lot of oxygen. And this is because um, oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis. Um, so kelp along with marine algae and photosynthetic plankton actually produce um, between 70 and 80% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's a lot. Um, a whole lot of oxygen comes straight from our ocean, so that's something to celebrate, right? Um, and something to be really excited about is that, you know, our ocean provides us with oxygen to breathe. And more than half the air that you breathe is probably from a marine photosynthesizer. Cool. So now that I've got your attention and shocked you with that fun kelp fact, um, what we're going to do next is start to paint the background. So. I've done this in a lot of ways. Um, one, you can paint the kelp in first um, and then paint the background after, um, which can be fine, but also a little bit challenging for me because I'm not really great at staying in the lines and then it bleeds all over the place. So another technique that you can do is paint all the way over through um, over the kelp and just painting the entire thing first. And then once that's dry, then we'll paint um, start filling in the kelp with a darker color. So that's what we're going to do today and just experiment with this technique. So what I recommend is getting kind of a bigger paintbrush. I have, um, let's see, this one or this one that I'll be using today. I'll probably use this one right now. And what I'm going to do first is also you want to make sure that you have like a rag to dry um, your paintbrush off. So you're just not like getting your um, painting super soaking wet. So I'm getting my paint now and what I'm going to do is you want to start with the darker color at the bottom because you're, if you think about the orientation of this kelp, um, the lower it is right here is like the bottom of the ocean and up here is more the top of the ocean. So when sun's coming down and percolating through the ocean, it'll be lighter up here and generally darker down here. So start with a darker color, whatever you've decided, um, and then we can start. So I'm just getting my paintbrush wet right now. And I'm kind of just like continuing to get it a little bit wet, um, maybe a little, having it a little bit darker down here. Um, and right when I get to about halfway, I'm going to actually add in a second color here. Um, 
So for my second color, it's just going to be another variation of blue, but just wanting to add a little bit of depth. And I am not the cleanest painter and tidiest painter in the world, but that's okay. And then as I get a little bit higher to, to the top of the painting, I'm going to add just a little bit of green um, because you know when the sunlight is coming in, and mixing with that blue, it kind of makes it a little bit lighter up there. And I just like adding green to try to mimic that light. So now you can see I have a very, very light layer that is, um, on the this piece of paper right now and, and you can keep adding if you're wanting to add a little bit more depth to it or a little bit darker color. The thing with watercolor that's really nice and something I had no idea about um, and I learned by trial and error is that you always want to start lighter um, and then you can just add on more. So the lighter you start, the better. And if you wanted to darken it up, you just add on layers. So we're gonna practice that technique today. So I'm just adding a little bit more and I think I'm happy with that. Cool. How, how is everybody coming along? Good. Yay. Awesome. Oh, looks great. Love it. Cool. So I'm going to get started um, on the next piece. So I think that mine is pretty much almost dry. I put a pretty light layer on it, but you do wanna make sure that this is dry just because I'm now gonna be adding, um, let's see, this like darker color on it. So you just wanna make sure that, that it's dry. So I'm gonna wait actually just a few more seconds. Thank you for the tip on starting lighter because I started way too dark and I totally get white. <laughs> and I pulled this piece out right here. So this is actually a piece of giant kelp with the bladder and as well as the blade that I found. And um, it's something that I like to just have out in front of me often when I'm drawing, just because it brings me a lot of inspiration. Same with all of my shells. <laughs> Great. So I think mine's pretty much dry. And what I'm going to do next is let's see which brush do I want. I'm going to grab this brush right here. So it's a little bit smaller. Um, and what I'm going to be doing now is just going through and adding my first layer to fill all of this in. Um, and so I'm just going to be using one color the entire time to fill it in and remember to just go light. Um, and it's okay if you could still see the color, um, that we just put down through it because we'll just continue to add layers. Um, and another thing to consider again is just where the light source is. So the light source for me is coming in down here and probably for you as well, because this is the surface, or at least I've decided that this is the surface. So the light is coming from this way. And that's important because usually wherever the light is coming from, it's a little bit lighter. So areas like this might be lighter, where over here might be a little bit darker. So 
feel free to get out your brown or whatever color you've decided that you'd like to paint your kelp. And I'm just getting mine kind of saturated with water so it's not super dark. And I'm just going to kind of start filling it in. And one technique that I like to use sometimes with kelp is, um, as you can see on, on this, is that the edges are kind of ripped and they're not uniform. And so sometimes if I'm wanting to mimic that rippedness, I'll just take my brush and just wiggle it around. And that kind of creates this like um, kind of rugged edge. So while I'm painting and while you are painting, um, I figured I can just drop another piece of kelp fact um, with this group because why not? Um, so kelp and as well as marine algae and seagrasses and seaweeds, um, since they get a lot of their nutrients from photosynthesis, um, means that they create oxygen, which is what we already um, discussed prior. But in order to create the oxygen and during photosynthesis, they actually absorb a lot of carbon dioxide too, um, which is something that's really um, important when we're thinking about climate change and how we're having an excess amount of CO2 in our atmosphere from human activities. So scientists are becoming super interested in how much CO2 or carbon dioxide kelp can actually um, capture and store in their biomass, so in their blades and in, their, in the stipe and the stalk. Um, and as a result, that would take the carbon that's in the atmosphere um, away from being in the atmosphere and contributing to warming um, and trapping it into the ocean. So this is something that's called blue carbon. Um, and it's something that's really exciting um, for a lot of marine scientists who are studying ways to mitigate the impacts of climate change and to reduce greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. Um, so that, that's something that I think is, is really awesome. Um, and the way, another way that they're able to do that is some kelp, they don't like, um, they're, they die every year, similar to like how some of our trees lose their leaves every year. It's the same thing. Um, so the way that that kelp is able to capture and store the carbon is when it dies, that carbon is in the different blades um, or different biomass of the kelp. And it actually sinks down to the very deep of the ocean and um, puts the carbon dioxide into the sand at the very depths of the ocean. So again, it's like making sure that that carbon is not interacting with the atmosphere or getting released into the atmosphere um, where it would then contribute to climate change. So one fun little tip is that, I'm not sure if you can see here, but I um, kind of went outside of the lines. So one way to kind of correct yourself is I just get my paintbrush a little bit wet um, and then you're able to just kind of erase it. So this is as somebody who is not good at staying inside the lines, I use this technique quite a bit. This is probably my favorite thing is getting to talk about kelp and wall painting with people. So I'm, I'm having a really great time over here. <laughs> And again, if anyone has any questions, um, just feel free to take yourself off mute. I'm happy to answer them as best as I can. Do you have any feelings about kelp farming while you're talking about kelp? <laughs> um, I think I have some feelings about kelp farming. 
Um, you know, people harvest kelp for food, for medicine, um, for all sorts of things. And I think that it just depends in the way that it's done. So in some ways, like, you know, there could be a really big market for kelp farming if, if folks are really trying to um, lean into the blue carbon space and thinking that, oh, maybe we can like really sequester and capture a lot of that carbon through increasing the amount of kelp that we have um, in, in our oceans, then that would be cool. Um, but yeah, do you have any thoughts about kelp farming? <laughs> I had listened to a podcast about the potential for the future of kelp farming and oh, nice. as, a, as a new food source that's more sustainable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Kelp also, um, I'm not sure, it, not giant kelp, but a certain, I forget what type. Um, so another big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions is meat um, and the types of meat that we eat. Um, and one of those um, big emitters is actually cows. And um, they're, I think also sheep as well. Anything that has multiple stomachs that, you know, it takes them some more time to digest and they create methane gas um, through their digestion process. And methane is a really strong, powerful greenhouse gas um, that is much stronger than carbon dioxide at, at warming our planet. So when, Actually, it's interesting, but when cows burp, um, they burp up methane. And we are, you know, raising so much livestock that the amount of methane that's coming out of our livestock is actually contributing to climate change, which is really wild. Um, but one thing that scientists have been studying are like, oh, well, what if we can change their diet? Because diet is a, a really big thing that's leading to this increase in methane production in our livestock. Um, specifically in cows. So they've actually been starting to feed them different types of seaweed to see if that would reduce the amount of methane that they're producing when they burp. And it's shown that they have. So um, there is this kind of push towards feeding livestock seaweed um, instead of regular um, feed that they've been giving them to try to reduce the amount of methane they produce. So little tangent. Um, but also a fun little little seaweed fact. Just, sorry, I was just picturing little mermaid cows. That's a really um, interesting thought. <laughs> um, cool, so I have painted my entire thing and I'm also realizing I didn't do the best job at taping down my piece of paper because it's kind of starting to curl. Um, so this next piece, now that we've done the background and now that we've done our base layer for our kelp, is we're going to be um, starting to add our second layer on our kelp. And this is where we're going to begin to add some depth to what we've created. Um, and I'm going to use the same exact color. And, but this time just a little bit darker. And what I'm really trying to do here is just to add more detail and kind of um, outline some of the features that I drew before, because right now it's a little bit like kind of monotone and muted. So I just changed my brush too, um, which is a little bit skinnier. And I don't know if you can see it, yeah. So again, right now I'm thinking of the light source and I'm making this darker, um, color down on the side that's facing more towards the bottom of the ocean. And remembering that, you know, kelp isn't super uniform. It's kind of all over the place. So I'm, I'm trying to mimic that a little bit in the way that I'm painting. And sometimes if you find that you've done something that's a little too dark, you can just get your paintbrush wet and just go over it and it pretty much acts like, a, like an eraser. I remember when I first started working with watercolor, I thought it was so unforgiving and I had no idea how to work with it. And slowly I've learned that it's the most forgiving um, medium that I actually work with 
And it's been really fun to just see how I can make so many mistakes and you would just never know because you can kind of just erase them. He wants to paint. He wants to paint. Hey Zoe, can I ask you a quick question? Uh -huh. um, so when you're putting this darker color on, are you uh, blending at all with the, the lighter color or? Nope, I'm not blending at all. Got it. <laughs> so if it comes to, if it's like a little bit too dark, I'm just adding in some um, water to it. So as we're adding in some detail to our kelp, I can share some more kelp facts because that's kind of what I'm here for. Um, so as our oceans have been getting warmer, there's been a lot of different impacts that it's been having on our marine ecosystems, which I'm not gonna get into and list the, the countless issues um, but I will talk about how warmer oceans have impacted our kelp forests. Um, so I think I mentioned before that our kelp, our giant kelp and bull kelp really like in water that's really kind of colder. So water that we have here off the coast of California, um, as well as, you know, just across the West Coast. And as our oceans have been getting warmer, um, and there's some currents that have been unusually warm, it's been really impacting and declining the amount of kelp forests that, that we have. Um, and in, since in 2014, there was an unusually warm current that hit um, the coast of California all the way up to Alaska. And since that current, there's actually been a 95% decline in our giant kelp forests as well as our bull kelp too. Um, and that's not only just attributed to having a really warm ocean current, and this is like linked to El Nino or La Nina, um, but it also has to do with several other things that are kind of related to warmer ocean currents. So one thing is that on top of there being a really warm ocean current that, um, you know, reduce the amount of nutrients that kelp are able to access. Um, the warmer ocean also contributed to something called sea star wasting disease, which I don't know if folks remember that, um, which happened, you know, maybe four or five years ago, but essentially it's exactly as it sounds, sea stars would get this disease and scientists think it has to do with water temperature that would pretty much have the sea star kind of melt and deteriorate away. Um, and it looked really disgusting and it was really sad. Um, California was hit really, really hard. And one of the sea stars that was hit was called a sunflower star. Um, and this, the sunflower star is like the top predator in, in the intertidal zone and as an invertebrate. Um, and so their favorite thing to eat was purple sea urchins. And as there has been less and less of our friend, the sunflower sea star, as a result, there's been more and more purple sea urchins in California and Oregon and all across the West Coast. And purple sea urchin favorite thing to eat is kelp. Um, so because there's been this like elimination really of the apex predator, the sunflower sea star, we've seen just this boom in urchin, which have then just been decimating our kelp forests. Um, and it's been kind of sad to see, and there aren't very many predators of the purple sea urchin other than um, sea otters. And we don't have a whole lot of sea otters here in California. We have some, but not as many as we used to. So this has become a real issue um, in marine conservation and science, especially here is, you know, we've been seeing our kelp forest decline. And I've shared with you a lot of the benefits to kelp, like food and medicines, as well as um, providing oxygen and storing carbon. But now we're seeing this crazy decline in them that we're not entirely sure how to, to stop. 
and I will offer some solutions. Um, and I think, you know, the main solution that I have for folks is to just do your best to try to reduce your carbon footprint or, um, you know, things that just reduce the amount of carbon that you're creating. So walking when you can or riding your bike when you can, um, maybe having some meatless Mondays because we, I just told you about cow burps <laughs> and how they contribute to climate change, but really just doing research and kind of seeing like what, what makes the most sense for you in terms of taking action on climate change. Cool, so now I've added my second layer. Yeah, my second layer um, and as you can see, I've, you can see that there's a little bit more definition in some of my pieces of kelp. Um, and I haven't been going over entirely um, to make the whole thing darker. I've just been going in into certain areas where I think it might be darker. Um, so places where it's like folding, it's a little bit darker there or on the outside, it might be darker there. Um, and so we're just going to continue that one more time around. Um, and just continue to add another layer of some um, dark features to really have it kind of pop. And this time around, I might even outline some of the bl kelp blades to really um, enhance them. Usually what I do as well is I really love to add pen and ink to all of my drawings. To me, it is a really great way to further enhance the colors and make things pop and um, adds a lot of definition to the things that um, I'm creating. So at the end of this, I'll kind of show you how I do it. It's a really long process, but I just wanted to be able to show you as well. I'm also quite a slow artist. Um, so this was really challenging for me to like try to figure out how to paint something in an hour, which I'm definitely not going to finish, but at least we're all kind of getting started. Um, can you tell me if it's like, uh, good or bad to use pen or pencil, like after you've already painted? Yeah. Um, I use pen always after I paint. Um, pretty much, unless somebody, I'm doing creating a painting for someone and they don't want me to use pen, then I don't. But it doesn't really matter. Um, if you are concerned about like having your pencil show through, usually the best time to erase it is right after you do um, how we did that first step of like painting the background and doing the base layer of the kelp at that point. Um, you haven't put a lot of paint on the piece of paper yet, so it's much easier to erase um, the pencil that you've put on there. Some people want to get rid of it, and sometimes I feel that way too, but I also kind of just like having it because it adds some detail. But the best thing to do is to make sure that you, if you're going to use pen afterward, is just wait until it's dry. And also my favorite, favorite pens ever um, are the Micron pens, um, and these are waterproof, so they don't bleed. So while folks are continuing to add the darker um, pieces to the kelp, this is a process that you can just continue doing until you are happy with what you've created, um, and you can just continue adding layer on layer on layer. Um, and just getting it darker and darker in certain spaces. The key thing though, is to just make sure you start light so then you can add some layers. You can always go darker, but you can't take some out of it. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is add, switch it up a little bit. And I'm actually going to add a little bit of green to um, some parts of my kelp. Now, most of the time there's some kelp that you could find that have a little bit of hues in green, but commonly they are the color of what I have pictured right here. They're pretty like, you know, kind of gold, dark brownish, um, but I just, you know, like to add in some accent colors. So right now I'm just adding a little bit of green to some places. Oh, I have a question. I've been noticing the brushes I have are um, like kind of uh, falling apart as I paint, like I'm getting little hairs on my paint. 
Do you have a favorite set of brushes you like to use? You know what? That's such a great question. And I don't have an answer for you. I don't even know where my paintbrushes came from. I've had them for so long. Um, and I can get back to you on, on that. And yeah, that is pretty much the only answer I have. <laughs> I feel like that's the like most sustainable thing and probably what most of us are using are just like the random set we have lying around. So I like that you're um, using what you have and not like snobby about your supplies. It makes it really easy for us to paint along. Thanks. There's a lot of really great supplies out there. I just, um, I, yeah, I pretty much use what I have until I need to get new stuff. There are a lot of different types of watercolor paints you can get. Like you can get these kind of dry ones that are in little cans, um, or you can get them in tubes, which is what you see that's you know pictured here. Is I've just squirted out a bunch. Um, I don't necessarily have a preference for either. I think that they both work the same. It's a little Altoid tin of paints, and that's that's what I used to use. <laughs> I definitely encourage folks to create a little travel watercolor kit um, because one, everything dries really fast. It's not a mess. You don't need a whole lot of supplies. Um, the cup I have right here is actually collapsible. So I take this backpacking with me and it's super lightweight. And it's just something that's really fun to do if you are interested in painting scenes. Um, where you're at. And I know my friend Lindsay's on the line here and she does it all the time. I always see her wherever she's at. I just use a bunch of mason jars and bring a water bottle, which has been really helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. I've had this little paint set forever and this is what I always bring backpacking. It's like the tiniest thing and I've lost like multiple of the little trays of paints. I love that. That's great. Yeah, it's great. It gets the job done. So I'm not completely done here, but I am noticing that we're almost at time. So I did want to be able to just show you on some of my dry parts, I add my pen um, and kind of the effect that it adds. So I'm getting my favorite Micron pen out. There's a bunch of different sizes here. So this is something that I, I do kind of nerd out on is the different sizes of the Micron pens. I usually have um, a 01, a 005, which is very, very tiny, um, and then a few others. So a lot of things that I do involve really tiny dots. And it's very, so I like having a smaller ballpoint pen. Which one are you using? This one is a, a, a one. So right now I'm just feeling around to see what is a little bit dry. And I, this one right here is a little dry. So what I'm gonna do now is just outline the bladder a little bit. and the blade. And usually I'll go around and add pen to the entire thing um, as kind of, again, just like one step. And then I'll go in and refine and smooth out some of my lines, maybe make them thicker in places where I think they need to be thicker, um, just to add some more of that definition and shadow and depth. Zoe, how do you, make it look 3D like that. I'm, I'm tracing it and it just looks flat. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so the way that I did that, how did I do that? Um, let's see, I kind of just cut it in half. So here, if you can imagine it's this whole entire thing and I just cut it right there in half and made it cross over. And I kind of did the same thing with this one right here. I can outline it a little bit more for you. 
and then just go like that. So you can really like add it into anything like this one. I don't have one right there, but I can just do a little crossover and then just close it out. And then it's kind of like a 3D kelp, if that makes sense. Great, so then I'm gonna go back to this piece of kelp and usually what I really like to do, and if you ever see my art is a lot of lines and a lot of dots that take a whole lot of time, um, but I just really love the way that it turns out. So I'm going to add a little bit of lines inside the kelp blade to really add some more shadow and definition to it. And then I like to add some dots as well. And so I know we're kind of running out of time right now, but you know, hopefully this is a really good start for you to continue painting your kelp and whichever way that you like and adding your pen if you would like to and dots and all the fun detail. And I can show you kind of what a final product looks like. It's not totally complete yet, um, but this is, let's see, there we go. This is kind of a, a final piece that I made a little bit ago. And you can see I've added some lines there and dots there as well. Um, and I still need to add some, but yeah, th this is something that it could look like at the very end. So I see that we're, we are a minute over and I just wanted to thank everybody for joining me and listening to me talk about kelp and rant about all the best things about kelp. Um, and I just really had the best time and hope to see you all soon. And I hope that if you have any questions about painting um, or climate change, marine science, kelp, just, you know, feel free to, I think I can add my email into the chat box um, and definitely go give my Instagram a follow if you are interested. Oh, cool. Thanks, Daniel. Um, if you are interested in kind of with me and seeing the different art that I I had a great time and appreciate everybody for coming. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, show me your kelps. <laughs> they look so good. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Bye. This was amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Bye.